The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about bringing the sexy back to defense in depth. Um, how many of you guys are on a blue team? I mean, your job is to defend a network. How many of you are on a red team? Your job is to attack a network. There's a couple of them out there. So why do a talk like this, right? Because this is not a, t spoiler, this is not a technical talk. Uh, I'm not a technical person. Um, the, the reason I started talking about this is there's constant complaints in our community around, you know, defense is hard. Um, we can't win. And we don't get any of the fun stuff. I mean, we don't get tools called Metasploit, right? Uh, we don't get the fun stuff. And it really bothered me because defense can and should win. And defense does win more often than not. And I'll explain how that works. But first, a little bit about me. Been doing IT for over 20 years. I've been doing InfoSec for about seven. Um, I've worked in a couple different um, environments uh, as far as uh, sectors. Former armor officer in the US Army. That highly informs how I view uh, the world. I do the Southern Fried Security podcast with uh, folks like Andy Willingham, Steve Reagan, Joseph Sicoli, and Yvette Johnson. Been doing it for the last three years. Uh, it's more or less weekly. You'll see a link for it shortly. Uh, I've presented places, and none of you care about that. I do have a lot of opinions, but I also want to hear, if you think I'm full of crap, you need to tell me you think I'm full of crap and tell me why, and then we can talk about it. So what's defense in depth? If you look at the Merriam-Webster uh, definition, it, you know, you can read it. I'm not going to read the slide to you. Notice what it doesn't talk about. Look at the all-covered definition where they define defense in depth as you've got to have antivirus and a firewall and IPS and da 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 and that, you know what? This is the problem. This is the problem, y'all. Defense in depth is a mindset. It's a way to think about the battle. It is not a list of crap you didn't implement right for the last five years. It's not a bunch of blinky lights. It isn't, and it never was, and it never will be. But so how did we get here? Blinky lights. We love blinky lights. As much as we, we kind of complain about it, we love them. We love, you know, five U appliances, right? Um, and we bought into this crap that the marketing droids gave us that said, install my stuff, right? My appliance du jour, and you will have defense in depth. And we drank the Kool-Aid that said if we spent our security budget on this stuff, everything would be fine. And we could just sit back with our coffee, watch the blinky lights, and nothing bad would happen. So we know it didn't work that way. Right? There's a, there, as you can tell, I'm a little passionate and very frustrated about where we are as a community. So what do we do? What is a blue team defender supposed to do today. What I love about, uh, hopefully some of y'all have seen Red versus Blue before. If you haven't, it's on the web. It's some of the best animation you'll ever see. Um, what we need to do is stop thinking about defense as being technologies. Yes, technologies are part of what we use. They're the tools of how, they're some of the tools we use to do our job. But if you're, what I want to do is kind of break this view that a lot of us seem to have that says defense is antivirus and firewall and all this other stuff. So I'm going, to, I'm going to propose an idea that you need to think about zones. And as you can tell from the sketch, this, this came from a book that I was very fond of at the Armor School. And I, th I believe there are three zones that as InfraSec folks we need to care about. The zone of observation, the zone of influence, and the zone of control. So zones. There's this concept called asymmetric warfare. How many of y'all ever heard of it? All right, ever since 9-11, we've talked about asymmetric warfare. And people want to say zones don't matter, right? Zones are security theater. 
um, whatever you want to say about it. That's complete and utter crap, right? Yes, we do have asymmetric warriors like the FARC, like Via Luminoso. Please tell me some of y'all recognize this guy. Right, this is Timothy McVeigh who uh, executed the, the bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building. And then we have our friends, the Taliban. Yes, these are asymmetric warriors, right? In the, they have to do asymmetric warfare because that's all they can do. They can't stand up and fight toe to toe, right? Asymmetric warfare is not what our, the folks at Mandiant generally talk about. Nation state cyber warfare is not asymmetric. Some of the tactics may be, but it's not. Asymmetric warfare is your typical red team guy, if you're a penetration tester or something like that, that's, I'm talking about you, okay? Because you've got a limited set of tools and you have to be able to accomplish your task one time. That's all it takes, one time. Me as the blue team guy, I gotta worry about thousands of you, right? So yes, defense is hard. But let's talk, let's examine the idea that you can't stop the asymmetric warrior thinking about it from a zones perspective. And zones, if you think about it, is, de is depth, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a meat space example. We're gonna use the International Stabilization Force in Afghanistan versus the Taliban, sort of like ultimate warrior sort of thing. So let's talk about the zone of observation. In the meat space, the zone of observation is, is um, acted upon by using aerial assets, signals intelligence, electronic intelligence, human intelligence, the eyeball calibrated Mark I, which I was really fond of at the cavalry school. It's, ob it's exactly what it says, it's observation. You can see the things happen to some level of detail or not. The analogous stuff in cyberspace, it's your threat intel subscriptions. Some of them give you an awful lot of detail. Some of them aren't worth it, even if they're free. Um, your IDS, you know, some of the stuff that Doug was talking about, the security onion can provide you, is a great way of observing what's going on. The full packet capture uh, stuff, and there's a ton. You can't swing a dead cat without hitting a full packet capture uh, appliance, vendor, or open source project these days. And then, this is, this is for the the more advanced players in our community, is using honeypots and canaries. Um, I, just as a caution with honeypots, right? If you don't do security well, don't do a honeypot. For example, like this. If you don't have locks on your doors, don't put a sign out in the driveway that says, I have a lot of shit in my house you can steal. It's the exact same thing, okay? So the zone of observation. You can look, but you can't touch anything, right? You can watch the packets fly by, but you've got no way of filtering, diverting, routing, or stopping them. The challenge is, and, and you, it kind of alluded to this in Doug's talk, where he talked about terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of storage. There's so much data out there, you can't analyze it all. Right? It's, just, it's, it's just not possible without spending more money than most of us probably have access to. It's hopefully, the other side of your perimeter demarcation, right? We, how many of y'all think the perimeter is dead? The perimeter is dead. Oh, come on, y'all. Of course it's dead. You cannot control what's inside your perimeter. How many of you think you have 100% control over what's inside your perimeter? Okay, so it's dead, right? <laughs> so you lose, I would suggest losing that verbiage. It's a demarcation. On that side of the fence is the bad guys. On this side of the fence is the good guys. Now, sometimes the good guys go out there and sometimes the bad guys are in here, but this is the line we're gonna draw on the sand. The other challenge here in the zone of observation is for most organizations, you have a very limited depth of scope or range you can look into. Now, if you're an ISP or you're a content network like an Akamai, you have the ability to look at a whole bunch of other people's crap as it flies by on your wire. Huge amounts of intel. Uh, Andy Ellis and I have talked about this, and the stuff that Akamai sees that they can't talk about is truly, truly frightening. But if you're like me, I've got a five hospital network, we have a couple of connections to the internet, I really don't have that much of a depth of, depth of, depth of field of view. But you gotta use what you've got. 
All right, the zone of influence. Um, in the meat space, this is where you see guys, you know, the, the, the Marines, soldiers out there doing patrols day and night. They're out there, irregular periods, irregular stuff, but they're out there. Random checkpoints. Um, working on a positive relationship with the population. I have friends who have done multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the number one weapon U.S. forces have and had out there was that little kid or that person who told them that there was an IED around the corner because that kid the week before had gotten an MRE. And then the biggest thing is rapid and effective response to incidents. If you look at what's happening in Iraq now, the reason the number of bombings has gone down, the reason the amount of violence has gone down is not because all of a sudden everyone drank some happy juice and they all love each other. No, it's because the government has finally figured out that when an incident happens, they flood the area and they actively and effectively investigate and find out who did these things. It deters people from doing it. So what's the cyberspace equivalent? We've got log review and SIM. I am not saying SIM solves all of your problems. In fact, badly executed, SIM will cause you more problems than it solves. Internal IDS and honeypots? SIM or SIM? What's SIM? Security, incident, and event management. Okay. Um, internal IDS and honeypots? Again, caution on honeypots. User education. All right, so how many of you think security awareness education is complete and utter bullcrap? One brave person, two brave people. Okay, for the longest time, I thought so too. And then I realized I was sort of a victim of my own thought process because here's the thing. If you think security awareness education prevents breaches, you're wrong. It doesn't, right? Because there's proof out there that says even us, we, we brave few who know what the hell we're doing, in theory, we still get owned. We still click the damn link. We do it. And if you say, no, I don't, you're lying or you're stupid. Pick one and you can choose on your own. Security awareness education is not intended to prevent a breach. It's, it's intended so that the person, when they click the link and have that oh crap moment, that they know to pick up the phone and call somebody. And they're not afraid to do it. A lot of organizations, people are afraid of InfoSec. We are the angels of death. If you can cultivate a more positive relationship with your user base where they know they can call that hotline number and they're going to talk to the, you know, the guy who, who's got you know, gauges and piercings and wears black all the time, but he's going to be nice and friendly and not chew them out because they clicked the link, you've just shortened your IR window tremendously. And from a blue team perspective, that's money. Because the longer that bad stuff is happening in its environment on its own, it's getting bigger and worse. Shorten that window of opportunity for the malware or the bad thing that happened, you've, just, you've, you've actually made your job a lot easier. And again, rapid and effective response to incidents. This is something that collectively in most sectors we totally, absolutely suck at. We suck at incident response. And if you want to argue with me later, uh, you're certainly welcome to, that's a different talk. So the zone of influence, it's monitoring, but it's got a kick. I firmly believe that 90% of, of a successful security strategy, security plan is IT operations 101. It's not even InfoSec. It's configura configuration management, monitoring, Patching and asset management, right? If you look at the DBIR, what percentage of breaches happened because the box wasn't patched? Virtually all of them, right? The zone of influence is gonna make up probably more than 85% of your network, right? Or what's on your side of the demarcation. But you need to be aware, things can move from influence to observation with a quickness. Here's an example. You have a server that you influence. It's, you're running configuration management on it, you're patching it, but the sysadmin is, does something silly and the box gets owned. What zone is it in? Observation. You've lost your ability to influence the box. It is doing something on its own. 
So your incident response is going to be needed to bring it back into the zone of, uh, zone of influence. Boxes move. Assets move from zone to zone to zone. So the zone of control. Um, some of y'all are really young, so. The green zone in Iraq and Baghdad, right, was a zone of control. Multiple fixed checkpoints, and you had to have multiple IDs and multiple passes to move from place to place to place or to get into a building. Every person, no matter who they were, gets fully searched. And now I'm not talking the little TSA rub you with the back of the hand crap. I'm talking, you know, gee, your prostate's doing extremely well this year. Um, only certified vehicles are allowed to enter after they've been searched. So how does, how does that control, right? And you can imagine, it's almost like a prison. In the green zone was kind of like a prison. How does that work in, the, in our space, in the cyberspace? Multi-factor authentication for every privileged transaction. Every privileged transaction. Now, sysadmins will scream and holler and complain and cry to mama about this. It doesn't matter. Um, you're doing deep packet inspection of everything that goes through. This is where you are taking security onion. You're taking a net witness box. You're doing whatever you have to to really watch what's going on. And you're doing really intensive configuration management. If there's a change that happens to a box inside the zone of control that you don't know immediately was an approved, scheduled, lawful change, that box gets thrown out of the zone. This is your crown jewels. This is the most important stuff for me in healthcare. It's where my electronic protected health information lives. Right, because I'm quasi-public, I really don't care about my financials. You can get those by a properly worded FOIA request. I care about the electronic PHI because as the designated security guy, I can go to jail if it breaches. Zone of control is, oh God, it's expensive. Not just in equipment, but in time. You're gonna have, you, you and the crafty minions on your team are going to be spending a lot of time watching the, the assets that live in this zone. Why? Because you're looking for reasons to throw stuff out. This is the most elite social club on your network. And for the moment an asset doesn't meet the high standard, it gets kicked out and it gets remediated. Because it's so expensive, very few places can do this for more than the crown jewels. I've, when I've, I've get, given prototypes of this talk, and I've had people claim 80% of their network is in the zone of control. Again, they're either lying or stupid, and they get to pick. So the point of it is, you have to be absolutely sure that before you allow an asset into this zone, it is what you think it is, doing what you think it is, and is trustworthy. And you keep checking, and you keep checking, and you keep checking, and you keep checking over and over and over. Tedious, laborious, tiresome? Yes. Again, but that's where your crown jewels are. So some generic rules of the zones. Natural progression of an asset left to its own is from control to influence to observation. Depending on how close they are to your demarcation, that process of control to influence to observation can be measured in milliseconds. Okay? But again, left to themselves. It takes about an order of magnitude, 10 times the effort uh, on a regular and routine basis to move an asset up a level. So it takes 100 times more effort to keep a box in the zone of control than to simply put something in the zone of observation. That's a, that, for those of you who do resource planning for people as in management, that's a huge thing. If you are unsure of what layer it goes in, well, it could be control, it could be influence, you always go to the lower one, always. When in doubt, push it down a level. But wait, I mean, because we've been talking about technologies and how you use stuff. But, I mean, how many of y'all have heard th this crap? Antivirus is dead. Sort of the first talk today sort of alluded to Signature AV being dead and it's, 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 it's bleeding badly, but it's not dead yet. And I'll, we can argue that later if you want. I've heard IPS is dead. Firewalls are dead. Except for the next generation ones that the marketing people want you to buy. And if they could have the PO by the end of the quarter, that would be fantastic. And I've also heard SIM is dead. Um, but here's the truth, right? Defense is hard. How many of you have ever said 
or thought to yourself, this statement here, red only has to be lucky once, we've got to be lucky all the time. I thought it and said it. You're probably frustrated because those guys, they get to wear the black t-shirts to work, they load Metasploit, they get all the stuff, and I can't keep up with them. Right? Sound familiar? Is this sort of like when you're sitting over a beer going, you know, yeah. If, how many of you think that in order to be successful, it means you can't be breached at all? Who thinks that? I know my boss did for a while. <laughs> right? If you think... And, and depending on your sector, that may or may not be true. Right? Even within the hospital environment. And, all right, so true story. Um, I was at Wellstar for about a month and a half, and I get a frantic phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning from the knock because the website got owned. And I'm like, holy crap. So run to the website, and I'm like, I'm looking at the front page, and I don't see anything. Start hitting the majors, still don't see anything. So I call them back, like, where? So they actually uh, sent me the URL, and it was for a associated physician office that you had to actually click 16 times to actually find. It only had 44 hits in the last two years. And these guys who called them the Iranian whatever, whatever, you know, leet hack sword and used a whole bunch of, it looked like a GeoCity site actually, flashing, and said that for the low, low price of $10,000, they would fix my website. We had our web guys hit a button, kill the page, reload it, all was good. Did I fail? Nope. That's actually kind of amusing. Pissed my wife off because she got woken up by the phone. Yeah, I got breached. I wasn't, that was, actually I call the incident response a success. Okay? The problem we have is defining winning. And Charlie Sheen, remember Charlie Sheen? Um, we need to look at what winning means as a blue team guy. Winning on the red team is easy. I owned your box. Woo! Beers for everyone. You know what? If you owned the box that got 44 hits over the last two years, yay you, Skitty. Um, okay. There is a point, for example, how many of you ever worked in like a large retail store, like a Walmart or a big bo other big box store? Okay. You may not know this, but in every one of their budgets the store manager has, there's a line item called inventory shrinkage. Now, it's not because the humidity is really high and clothes get smaller. It's because people pick stuff up and walk out with it and they don't pay for it. I know, it's shocking. It is shocking to think about this, but it does happen. What percentage do you think the average Walmart manager, total annual inventory, do they expect to walk out the door without being paid for? 25, three. Who said three? It is, it's 4%. 4% shrinkage is considered pretty doggone acceptable in retail. Now, convenience stores, it's closer to the 2022, right? Because you sketchy people who go to convenience stores, right? So, ding, ding, that's exactly it. Right? It's a risk-based analysis. If, if Walmart, they, they know people are going to steal their stuff, right? So you, one, you build it into your profit margin, right? And if there's a company in this world that understands how to calculate profit margin, it is Walmart, right? You can like them, love them, but they've got their business model down to a science. And they, so they accept the reality that bad things are going to happen in a store, now, in a Walmart store, if they get down to 2% inventory or shrinkage, the manager gets an attaboy, maybe a bonus. If a store is like at 6 or 8%, the manager gets fired, right? Because they're tracking to a metric. The same thing applies for us. There are going to be security incidents. People are going to click links they shouldn't. Boxes are going to get owned, right? Um, things are going to happen. I've got around... 32, 33,000 computer devices, not including biomedical, computing devices hanging on my network. All right? Not yet. Are some of them owned? Yep. Is that okay? For the most part. We'll get to them. We're going to fix it. We have a list of stuff we're remediating. 
And every day there's things that come off the list and there's things that go on the list. And we scrub it for the which ones are really important. You know, if it's you know, the CEO's administrative assistance computer, that goes to the top of the list. Not because of she works for the CEO, because she has access to stuff that's really, really important. Okay? If it's the, and we, we had these at the hospital, um, ever, they used to be called candy stripers. They're volunteers. If, a volu if the volunteer coordination workstation in the hospital gets owned, we'll get to it. Right? It's, it's not going anywhere. It's sort of off on its own little segregated you know, VLAN. We'll get to it. That's what winning is about. It's defining what losing looks like and realizing winning is the rest of it. The, the Walmart manager doesn't focus on the 4% of stuff that went out the door. He focuses on the 96% that stayed in there and people paid way too much money to buy. All right? Make sense? Hope so. So how do we win as a defender? You gotta know what you're defending and you gotta spend your resources defending what really matters. And here's the challenge for all y'all. If, how many of you really, and you got, this is honesty here, really understand how your organization makes money? If you don't, you need to learn that. Because if you don't understand how your company makes money, you have no idea what to defend. None, zero, nada. And I'm willing to bet because we are all technologists at heart, you will be defending exactly the wrong things. Because we're gonna use our biases, our knowledge, what we think is important. But I can tell you from experience in commercial aviation, financial, and now healthcare, what we technologists think is important is almost always wrong. Almost always. So you need to learn how your company makes money. You know, it was very interesting for me joining healthcare, learning how we make money. And if you want to learn how healthcare is similar to retail jewelry, we can, we can talk about that later too. So how do you win? You've got to resolve that the adversary is not going to win today. Not today, not on my watch. Yes, I talk about the fact that you're gonna, there's gonna be a 4% you know, inventory shrinkage. But today, that may happen tomorrow and it happened yesterday, but today, it's not gonna happen. You've got to believe in what you're doing. You have to believe in the people to your right and left. And if you don't, you have a problem to fix, right? But even with that, you're going to take losses, okay? The key is not to make those losses meaningless. And this is where I'd say we suck at incident response. I've seen companies that you ask them, so how many AV, uh, you know, malware infections do you have in a year? A thousand. Okay, how many different types of malware? Ten. So a hundred, on average, a hundred machines are getting infected every year. Are you changing what you're doing at all? No. If you're not using instant response to learn and get better, yeah, you need to become a Walmart greeter, all right? Because their job's fairly consistent. Uh, our job's always changing. I mean, you heard in the first talk today, how many different malware samples could he have generated in that talk? Thousands, right? That is our challenge. And if we don't use everything we do to get better, we suck. Which leads us to this. We have to mix things up. Um, in too many uh, webinars, seminars, con talks, there's this conversation about the way to do something. We've all seen it, right? We, some of us may actually believe it. The thing is, if you do the same thing for the same time, for, I mean, what's the expression? If you, do this, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. That ain't true in InfoSec. If you always do what you've always done, really bad shit's gonna happen to you. Because are the bad guys changing? Hell yeah. All right, the skitty today has more capability than the targeted elite hacker of seven years ago. Really. They do. They've gotten that much better, which actually means that the people who are writing the, the tools, right, the automation's getting a hell of a lot better, right? If we're not keeping up, and I'm not saying we gotta get better than them, we never will. Their, bill, their OODA loop is a lot shorter than ours. But if we don't keep up, 
uh, yeah, then, then you're losing. So you got to learn from yesterday. you got to plan for tomorrow. And those of you who are in management, planning is two-thirds of your job. you got to fight for today. So my invitation, my challenge to you is to join the blue team. And I'm not saying just be part of it, but join it. We have cookies, and we have caboose, and we have an opportunity, I, I think, and I, I passionately believe this, and I talk about this a lot on the podcast, we can make a difference. We can take our, our job and turn it into a profession. Businesses, when I, you know, I, I brief our audit committee uh, once a quarter, and I've been at Wellstar now almost two and a half years. The quality of question I'm getting from my board of trustees is improving every cycle. My boss's knowledge of how InfoSec works, and she's the VP of compliance, right? She's, she's not a technologist. Her questions are getting better, right? Which makes it easier for me to go, I need some consulting money, or I need this tool, or I need staff, right? We can take what we do, get the business to appreciate it, fund it at a, in a, in, and prioritize it at an appropriate level, and then we're winning. So I invite you to come join the blue team. It's a lot of fun. Um, there are usually beers on Friday after six. So with that, this is my contact info, and I think I've got some time because I talk really fast. Um, questions, comments. Who thinks I'm utterly full of crap? There's always one person. That person's not brave today. What do y'all think? I'll take the hit. You're totally not utterly full of crap, but a lot of what you say is very difficult to apply outside of the enterprise space. It's very, very hard setting expectations in the small business space to get the business owners and decision managers to spend dollar one on security. I absolutely agree. I actually think blue team is hardest in the mid-market. It's... It's easier in the really small shop because there's not a lot of attack surface. It's, we're, well, in comparison. Then you have the enterprise, right, where some, some of y'all believe that as an enterprise user, I have like this unlimited fire hose of money. I, I don't, I, I'm a not-for-profit healthcare provider. Um, but in that mid-market, right, I'm talking, you know, something more than 25 users, between like the 25 and thousand user space, that mid space, that's probably the hardest place in the world to do security on for exactly that. Because your attack surface grows exponentially as, you, as the number of users you have goes up, right? Because users do silly things. Um, but the budget and the resources you have to buy the stuff, the blinky lights that I get to, uh, to buy, just isn't there. Now, the cool thing as a community, we've done projects like Security Onion. We've done other, well, there are other open source projects out there that enable you to get near enterprise grade stuff for a reduced amount of investment. And generally the payoff is there. Uh, the open source projects don't have the management um, interfaces or the um, management ability that's expected at the enterprise or required at the enterprise, which means you gotta throw more people at it, more time at it but you're getting the technology you need. Um, the challenge is that in order to make those open source projects better, and we were having a little conversation about it earlier, around, in healthcare, security onion's a great thing, but I can't rely on it because HIPAA says I can't. Um, so you need a four pro you know, somebody to go, okay, I'm gonna make this, I'm gonna do training and support, and there's gonna be quarterly releases, and all of a sudden it's become an expensive enterprise product, right? Because the people who invest in it know that the price point for that is over here, and they expect this amount of return on their money. So yeah, in that mid-space, it's hard. But defense is hard. Um, and you just gotta, you gotta suck it up and soldier on. Yes? I'm not gonna say that you're full of crap, but I will say that from an enterprise perspective that everything that you said, the more money you spend at the end when you get breached, you can actually say, hey, we, we have all this like this Yeah, there's a real, so the thing is, you know, if, it, if you get breached, you can show that I spent a obscene amount of money is mitigation for the bad thing that happened. Um, 
Yes. Look at, for example, there is a payment processor in Atlanta, uh, Global Payments, that uh, got breached about a year ago, I think, and has spent from their pub they're publicly saying over $100 million reading the breach, which is a, that's a metric boatload of money. But they still recorded a $300 million profit, all right? So yes, there is a challenge that there is a perverse incentive that simply throwing money at stuff at, at, in the for-profit enterprise space, there's a, there is a motivation to do it. It's perverse and it's wrong, but it's there. That's mitigating for the CEO, though. If you're the security guy, it's actually my thing back because we gave you all this money to spend and still let us get free. Oh, yeah, it's called accountability, yeah. If you, that's the danger in those situations where... And that's kind of where I'm at. When I first came to Wallstar, there was very, very little spending on security. And I managed to sell some um, business cases and we seriously ramped it up. So am I now accountable and responsible if a bad thing happens? Yes. That's why I'm the director of information security. I'm responsible for everything my team does and fails to do. Right? Because that's, as, a, as an army leader, that's what I was, it's part of my DNA. And to me, that's part of the challenge of being an InfoSec leader. I relish that. I, I enjoy that risk. Some people don't, and you know, it, takes, it takes all kinds. Not everyone can be a CISO, or should be. Anything else? Was this what y'all expected? No, yes, kind of. Better? Oh, thank you. So here's the deal. You can get a hold of me on these things. Um, if the topic we talked about interests you uh, on the podcast, how many of y'all listen to the podcast at all? Wow, thank you. Um, we talk about this kind of stuff all the time. Uh, occasionally more ranty than other times, um, especially if Andy and I start going at it. Um, one of the things we do love is, is having our listeners interact with us. We've actually made changes to the podcast because listeners suggested it, so please. Unfortunately, I've got to bolt as soon as I'm done here. I've got to drive back to Atlanta. Um, but definitely, please get in touch with me. It's been fantastic talking about all. I genuinely appreciate it. And uh, I think we need we, the, the, the B-Sides Charlotte organization team. Stand up, guys. Stand up. I've been to a whole bunch of B-Sides. Um, this is one of the best run ones I've ever seen. And the, sh the fact that this is the first one truly, totally, stunningly amazes me. So, yay you. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication from Wicked.
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astros based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astros or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astros. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a the thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room 
twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.